and give it over to uh, Brian and Paul, who are going to do the first of our talks. We're going to do talks next year as well. They are going to talk about their experience, which is really interesting in going from AAA design into full-blown indie to now some sort of middle ground. Uh, but they're good friends of mine, and I thought they would be a great people to uh, just come and do a really great talk about indie game design and where they've been, and I don't know. Have fun. Cool. Thanks Have fun. Yay. Am I in a good spot? Good? Are we good? Awesome. Well, hey, everybody. Um, my name is Paul Arith, and this is my very good friend and uh, business partner, Brian Gish. And we're going to be talking a little bit today about uh, some of our experiences um, working on both uh, indie projects as well as um, AAA projects and uh, a whole lot of crazy side projects. And we'll be showing a few things that we've actually never shown to anyone before. So that might be cool, or you might throw stuff at us. We'll have to figure that out, I guess, when the time comes. Um, one of the videos we're going to be showing, we're going to wait until the very end to show because we haven't announced it yet. So you guys will get to see it, but it just won't be recorded. Um, so yeah, so I guess without further ado, um, do I have a clicker for my slideshow presentation? You can just be like, click. <laughs> I might have to. Do like a stylus I can. I can just run over here. There we go. So, <laughs> so this is um, this is kind of a quick introduction um, of some of the projects that Brian and I have worked on. Um, a whole lot of totally different things, from mobile games to film to competitive shooter to MMO RPG and FPS. A whole lot of different things. Um, None of our side projects are up here, and those are many of the things that we're going to be talking a lot about. Um, but this is kind of our background um, professionally. Click. <laughs> Did it. This is super impossible to see. So this, um, yeah, we might have to kill the lights for a second. <laughs> sure. There we go. So some of you guys might recognize all of these textures and everything from Half-Life 1, which is what I totally ripped it off of. Um, this was the very first side project or indie project I ever did, um, which was the first game project I, I pretty much ever did. And it was a mod for Half-Life 1 called Box War. Um, I did it when I was like 17 years old, I think. I'm totally going to date myself, but I, was, I think I was a sophomore in high school. Um, and I just really wanted to make games, but I had no idea what I was doing. So Valve was awesome and released a whole bunch of really cool development tools. And I just started totally not knowing what I was doing, but basically failing my way into a game. Um, I was trying to make a fully rigged character, and it wasn't exporting. It just was totally broken. So I thought that to just get it working, I would assign a box, just a cube, to the root of the, the, the skeleton rig. And I finally got it to export. So I was a cube running around a level. Um, and that was awesome. So just to mess with my friends, I textured it. And then we would play multiplayer. And I was a box running around on the level. And I noticed that if I stopped moving, everyone would just run past me because they thought I was just part of the level. And that's how this came to be a game. I basically turned all player models into box meshes. And um, I found a programmer that wrote a routine that would randomly generate boxes in the levels that I built. And so every time you played the level, boxes were in different places. And if you stopped moving, you couldn't tell who was a player and who um, wasn't. Um, and so if you, if you want to hit to the next slide, I can actually show a quick video. <laughs> oh, sweet. Awesome. What do I do? Can I, does, will it play the video if I click the middle one? The right one? Oh, that one forward again. This one? You might have to just click on the left side of the screen. So this is, I totally ripped this off of uh, YouTube because I don't have any footage of this. Uh, and this is just to get an idea of what the game actually looked like. I had no idea what I was doing, so I just started 
exporting stuff. I, I started adjusting models and uh, a few textures. This is one of the few weapons we actually made that was different. It was a flamethrower. Um, all of this looks like deathmatch, because it is, but um, where the game got magical, which I couldn't find footage of, is when you were in the warehouse, and there were like five other players, and you didn't know which, one, which of the boxes they were, and nobody wanted to make the first move, and so you would like just sit there and stare at your screen, and then you'd see something move, and you're like, aha, and then you'd run over there to kill it, but then you couldn't tell which one it was anymore, and then they would kill you. It was just a crazy stealth game. So that was my very first uh, experience with game design and development. Um, it ended up being downloaded by, I think, more than 80,000 times and was played at the Games by National Convention in Japan. Um, and it got me my first ticket to E3, which was pretty cool. Um, so this was kind of the moment that I knew like games were totally possible to make, even if you had absolutely no idea what you were doing, like me. So um, that was Box War. Um, the Half-Life mod is still floating around out there somewhere. So um, after this, I just kind of went through college and learned how to do more stuff, um, 3D modeling. I ended up getting a job working on this movie called The Barnyard, which had male cows with udders. Um, and uh, that was a cool experience, but I really just wanted to get back into games again. Um, so I ended up working on that for a year until we finished the movie and then moved back up here, uh, worked on a game called Shadowrun, which fans and critics were not super crazy about. And it did win one award for worst box cover art, <laughs> which is pretty amazing that we won an award. Um, it actually ended up being one of the most played demos on Xbox Live, though, which was kind of interesting because there were like two levels and everything else was fully unlocked and playable. So people would just play the game for free, and that's all they cared about. Um, but that was, that was, this was probably the first time where I actually started learning about true level design technique. Everything before that was just self-taught. And um, one of the best experiences I had, especially working on big AAA teams, is that there is such a huge wealth of knowledge and experience that you can learn from and pull from um, that I ended up learning from John Howard, who was the lead designer on Halo, and uh, a few other amazing people. Sage Merrill, who's uh, at Bungie, their lead, uh, their lead systems designer. And uh, so learning from these people that were just so incredibly intelligent and uh, so experienced uh, helped me develop my skills very, very quickly, and because I had to. Um, after FASA shut down, I went to work on, uh, at Sony, SOE Seattle, which was in Bellevue with uh, this fine gentleman over there. And this was the first time that we got to work together. Um, and this was, I don't know how to do math, but it was 2007. Yeah, I think it was 2007. I don't know how many years that is. <laughs> but uh, it was years ago. Um, and this was, this was cool, because um, this was the first time that I think we both were like, hey, let's just make something crazy together. And it ended up being this thing called Vibe, Project Vibe, which was I wanted to build a game that would enhance the way that people listen to music, just be like a kind of like an easygoing, relaxing experience where you could plug in your music and just fiddle with something. If you want to hit the screen on the left there. So this is, we, I don't think we've ever showed this to anyone before. Um, all of the terrain that you see is dynamic, uh, dynamically generated, um, reading the waveform. So when the music is quiet, everything is flat. Um, and then when the music picks up, it starts building waves in the terrain. And so that was just kind of the gist that you'd have just like a really simple side-scrolling shooter that you could just kind of turn your brain off and plug into your music and, and just kind of like have a good time. Um, and then it was the basic mechanics was um, you could shoot enemies and pick up orbs. And this was one of the, the interesting things that we started learning was about what's called emergent gameplay, where it's gameplay that's really cool and fun, but you didn't originally plan for it. Um, we started noticing that it was really fun to shoot the orbs, and you could actually pass them between players. So we made it co-op. Um, the health bar is the three lights on your ship. So first they get cracked, and then they get broken. So you basically have six health points. Um, so we just started throwing orbs around and back and forth, and then we started taking advantage of that and rewarding players for doing that. 
So we would um, let you level up your ship if you collected three of the same color. Um, the orbs would also heal you. So if one of your friends picked up two orbs and you just found a new blue orb, you could pass it over to them and then they could uh, pick it up. So that was one of the early lessons we used. Did you want to add anything? Um, so working on this, it was like Paul said, it was one of the first projects we ever worked on and we learned our first lesson, um, pick the right game engine. <laughs> <laughs> so this was actually, um, run, this is actually uh, on the Xbox 360, it was using an XNA engine called Torque X uh, 2D. Um, and uh, it was really fun because it's amazing what you can learn when you use a basically beta engine. You have to implement a lot of your own stuff because pretty much 90% of what you need it was missing. But yeah, this was a really fun project, especially getting to learn about audio for the first time and uh, understanding how to actually read in that data. That was a fun experience. Yeah. Yeah, and it was crazy just trying different types of music and seeing how it affected the terrain. Maybe one day we'll get back to it. So that's uh, that was Project Vibe. Um, and we, we both kind of worked on that while we were at Sony together. Um, <laughs> cool. <laughs> you haven't thrown stuff at us yet. Awesome. Um, so I went on after Sony to work at Microsoft Research, um, working on what was then called Project Natal, which uh, ended up becoming Connect, and then worked on Connect Adventures um, and did some design work on that. Um, and I can't remember what I was going to say about this. Mostly that it was just probably one of the most bizarre projects I've ever worked on because for the first time you had to design gameplay around not having a controller at all, no buttons, no input at all. Um, you are the controller, as we said. And so that was, uh, that was a really, really interesting design challenge, a set of design challenges. I remember one of the early kind of things that we tried that didn't end up working out was um, we had what looked like zippers for menus. Um, so you would like, reach out and grab the zipper and slide it to um, go to the next menu. But we'll, <laughs> yeah, it was weird. Um, but what we found out usability-wise is that what people would do is they'd just be like doing this and moving their arms because it was cool to see your character on screen move around. And then their hand would accidentally grab onto the zipper and they'd be like, oh no, I didn't want to do that. And then it would zip it anyway and it would go to the next menu. Um, so it was kind of during this time that they developed the system for holding out your hand um, and then it would count up and that way if you were like, oh, I didn't want to do that, um, it would immediately drop it out of the, uh, the, the count up timer to go to the next menu. Um, and then I started, after that project, I was um, asked to interview for Halo and the, the main reason I wanted to talk about this was to talk about the interview process for Microsoft. A lot of you guys have probably heard about how rigorous the interview process is. Um, sadly, I didn't get to go through that interview process. I had to go through like craziness. So basically, um, it started out with a half hour long phone interview, which led to a two hour long in-person interview with uh, two of the leads. And then that gave me the design test, which I spent 80 hours on while I was still crunching on Connect Adventures. So I basically come home at midnight and then work until like 2 or 3 a.m. Um, on that. Um, this is kind of the design test that I ended up completing. Um, it was basically make, you know, make a Halo level, come up with a Halo mission. Um, so I just kind of built this in 3D and kind of came up with something that I thought would be like a really cool classical Halo mission and ended up uh, just kind of importing it into the Unreal Engine, which was amazing, because all I had to do was just model it and then import it, and then I was able to run around in that space. Um, so that was really cool just to be able to test my stuff and, and see whether or not it was gonna be fun or not just by very quickly building stuff in 3D and then, um, and then uh, being able to play through it. Um, and then after I completed this test, that got me into the eight hour long non-stop interview process at Microsoft. Uh, during that process, I had to take three half hour long written tests. Yeah, it was, wow. it was good. Luckily they, for me, when I applied it uh, at uh, Microsoft, it was actually for a um, develop, uh, tools developer role. I at least only had to do the eight hours up on a whiteboard sort of, uh, solving pro, uh, programming problems. Yeah. So I, I guess I lucked out. If anybody wants to know the trick to the Microsoft interview is 
slow. You go very slow. You talk very slowly. And if, if anybody asks you a, a question, they're speaking very quickly, you just say, that's a really good question. Here's how I would answer that. Uh, and then spend a lot of time asking them questions, too, because the whole thing goes through lunch as well. There is no breaks during that, that whole thing. Um, so that was, that was my original paper design for that level, in case you wanted to see how it goes from paper to the final thing, uh, just to get it in the engine. Um, so I started working on Halo. I got, I got the job. Um, <laughs> Um, and around this time, Brian and I were still working on side proje projects together, and we wanted to, Brian had this really good idea to uh, build a word game for mobile devices, and, yeah. and he, you prototyped it in like a night. Yeah, the basic premise is um, I suck at word games, and um, <laughs> I hate the fact that you always have to use touching adjacent letters. So I'm like, hey, I have this idea. I don't want to have that restriction at all. I want to give you as many letters as possible, and I want to make it... Uh, I want to make it as easy as possible. And then he added all the cool stuff that actually made it fun. Posh. Um, yeah, so this was, this was a really interesting project. Um, this is also where we were, a lot of free-to-play stuff was coming out. Um, and this was becoming like the new norm. And people were saying like, oh, free-to-play is the new thing. So we were like, all right, let's try to do free-to-play. Um, so we did like this ad-based model. Um, do you remember how much revenue we were making? <laughs> um, it's been out on the Windows Store for about three and a half years, and I think we're about to break $50. <clears throat> <laughs> we're almost there. We're almost there. Um, so that was really cool. It's actually, it actually ended up getting very high review scores. Yeah, it's like a 4.7. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that went actually really well. Um, I think we spent about two years working on that part-time. Yeah, we got bit in the butt so bad about Torque X. I'm like, ah, I'm screwed. I'll just write my own game engine in XNA. So yeah. <laughs> that also had its downsides, but I learned a lot. Like, XNA is one of the coolest technologies I think ever, so it makes me really sad that they cut it. But like, being able to actually write a game from scratch, all the animation stuff, learning about atlases, oh, so many good things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a really good project. Um, but now that Unity has 2D stuff, just, just, just use Unity. Unity is amazing. So I started working on, um, I was the first campaign designer under the leads um, on Halo 4 um, before it was announced. And um, the, f the original, a lot of people don't know this, but the original game for the single player was set to start on the planet. The first level was going to start on the planet. Halo 3 kind of ended with... Master Chief on the Ford Unto Dawn that was just kind of you know, out of power and floating. And then if you beat the legendary ending, it, you saw that this weird looking alien planet is floating towards it. Um, and then it cuts to black. Awesome way to end that, that, uh, that game. Um, and so this one, they were like, OK, you're going to wake up on this planet now. Um, some of the, the thing that bothered me about that plan was that some of the previous Halo games had a very kind of slow start to them that were, they were really cool. It was just kind of a slower paced start where they had kind of a, a really cool build up to action. And I felt like this game to really come back out as like the Halo that people remembered, I wanted to go back to what I loved so much about Halo 1. So, and this is where I actually ended up learning one of my most probably one of the more important lessons that I've learned is, is the importance of, of pitching things and getting people excited about what you're excited about. And so I had a different uh, proposal. And so I basically proposed, instead of starting on the planet, we would start on the ship. You would wake up, um, alarms would be going off, and you wouldn't know why. And so it would be like basically on a collision course with the planet, and you know, the Covenant is starting to attack, the planet's pulling you in, um, just like have super intense action. Um, the ship starts breaking apart and you're jumping between sections as it's separating in low G. Uh, just like really go nuts with, with action and intensity. And then finally the planet ends up pulling your ship in and we'd fade to black and then you would wake up on the planet and then you would uh, begin the exploration. Um, as the game, uh, the second level, now starts in Halo 4. Um, but what's funny is nobody liked that idea. <laughs> I, I like proposed it, and people were like, eh, yeah, that's eh, okay. We'll just start it on the planet. And I was like, okay. 
And so I started wondering, like, why, why was it that I was so excited about this, but I couldn't really convey it to other people? I couldn't, like, they weren't seeing what I thought was so cool and exciting about this moment. Um, and so I started trying to figure out, like, how could I share my excitement with them that would get them excited? And so I remembered that there's a movie um, that started out almost the same way um, that I, I could bring in and be like, this is like the coolness that um, we can show. If you want to hit that. Um, this is from uh, the Pitch Black uh, Chronicles of Riddick, the first Chronicles of Riddick film. It's about a minute long. So I ran home, I grabbed my DVD, I ran back to work, I played this in the meeting room, and after that they were like, cool, sounds good, let's do that. Um, <laughs> so I started thinking, like, this is like, really cool that, that you know, it's, like, it's not about like, what I think is cool, it's about me learning how to share my excitement with other people in a way that they can relate to. Um, and that's one of the, probably one of the most important lessons I've learned as, as a game developer is that it, it doesn't really matter how cool I think something is if, if no one else thinks it's cool. Um, so now I usually just try to find ways of, of helping other people relate to why I think something is awesome or exciting. And it doesn't always work. Sometimes I'm wrong about things or sometimes I just think something really boring is cool or whatever. But uh, it, it totally changed the way that I present things to other people and I really look for ways that that we can both kind of find common ground in, in something that we're excited about. Um, so during Halo production, I wanted a tool that would help me sketch out level designs, uh, like, a, like an architectural sketch program. And Brian wanted an infinite canvas like drawing app. So we started working on this uh, side project called Blueprint, uh, sketch and plan in our free time. This is probably one of the faster projects that we got up. Yeah, I think I had a demo up uh, within a, a, a month or two. I think we had a pretty much workable uh, app. Yeah. Yeah, so basically what it was was uh, just a simple, like you can run it on a PC with a mouse and keyboard, or you can uh, use stylus and like a Surface tablet or any kind of touch screen uh, tablet device. And um, so I started using this for just when I was sitting on my couch at home, just kind of sketching out ideas for level designs that I could you know, share with other people um, and email to other people easily. And weirdly enough, this actually ended up becoming, um, I think, our most profitable. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Way more than $50. Yeah, how much did we, um, what was this pulling in? So it's been out for about two years now. Um, basically, at its peak, it was making like 350 a month. So I mean, it's yes. not like we can quit our jobs. But <laughs> I mean, still to this day, we rake in about $100 a month. So It pays for it, our software. Yeah, I think it's bought us one or two Unity licenses. So yeah. it kind of did its job. Yeah, and somehow Microsoft ended up finding, um, finding out about it in the Windows Store, and they ended up using it to sell their giant whiteboard-sized uh, touch devices to a bunch of different corporations. I think they call them Surface Hubs now, but I think they called they? them PPI displays before that. Yeah, um, and so this was them using uh, Blueprint to uh, pitch their devices to Toyota. They, they showed it to GM and Disney and I think a few others as well. So that was a really cool experience. Um, it was kind of nice because my entire career, I've always been a tools programmer, so it was kind of, I got to actually work on a tool outside of my day job. Yeah. So um, I was just going to cover some quick things because a lot of people are like, oh, should I be indie or should I, be, should I go and work at a big studio? Um, there's a lot of positives and some negatives to each one. Uh, the main pros, uh, and these are very general rules of thumb, by the way. There's tons of exceptions to these rules. These are just very general guidelines. Um, that AAA tends to uh, pay better. You get your medical benefits. There tends to be uh, more stability. 
Um, I don't have to worry about what I'm doing in three months from now. Um, and you get to work on higher pro profile projects that have more marketing dollars involved, and you don't have to usually worry about that stuff yourself. Um, the cons are that you usually have less creative freedom um, and a lower impact role, more, more sp uh, specific role, and that can kind of make you feel like a cog in the machine uh, that you, you kind of hear about. And there's much more of an approval process uh, that can kind of grind creativity to a halt sometimes, um, where if I want to move this rock over here, sometimes I had to get the approval of like three or four different leads to make sure that they were okay with it. And it's just like, I just want to move the rock. Um, <laughs> So, so there's definitely some pros and some cons to uh, that. So you made a game about rolling rocks. I made a game about that rock because I just wanted to move it. Yeah. Um, so with indie stuff, what's so awesome about it is that you have so much creative freedom. Um, even with like you know working on box war, we just had crazy ideas, and then we just did it. You know we didn't have to ask anybody, and that's awesome. We had no, we didn't have to worry about scheduling or time constraints. We could just kind of work whenever we felt like it. Um, you have a super high impact role. That can also be kind of stressful because if you don't know how to do something, you should hope that somebody else on your team does because if they don't, you're just kind of hitting up websites and stuff. Um, and there's very little approval process. You know, I'll tell Brian I want to do something crazy and he'll be like, cool. Um, the cons can be that you often have low or no budget. Um, and that can be also stressful because when you're worried about like, can you pay rent? It can kind of force decisions that you have to make, um, which can kind of feel not super great. Um, there's often less stability where, you know, like we weren't sure if we were going to get our budget or not, and ultimately we ended up having to kind of switch to another um, situation. And uh, marketing now and like getting views on your stuff is one of the biggest challenges for mobile games because there's so many coming out now that that can be a huge challenge. Um, and just getting you know, visibility is tough. Um, but yeah, so that's, a lot of people are like indie or AAA, and I, I usually say, why not both? You know, <laughs> games are my hobby, so while I'm working at AAA Studios, we're still working on crazy side projects. So the final kind of, did you have anything else to wrap? Yeah, I was just gonna um, kind of say that uh, that's the funny thing about indie and AAA. It's like you need experience to get in AAA, so you have to start doing some indie. And then you do some indie, you get into AAA, you learn a lot more. Um, it might be a little bit more specialized, but you still learn a ton. And then you do some indie on the side, it gets you, makes your indie games even better. It, it's been a, we pretty much have the exact same experience. It's kind of funny how much we bounce back and forth between the two. Yeah. So yeah, so we're always, it's funny, like, you know, going from one of the bigger AAA studios, you know, there's like 500 people at, at 343 Industries. Um, to five people, which is what we started at at this company, uh, very much changes the dynamic of things. It was very cool. Um, so the final kind of final thoughts are, are that there's super great things about working on both indie and AAA, um, and they don't have to be mutually exclusive. Um, we're usually working on some combination of, of both of them at any given time. Um, do it because you love doing it. And you know, you'll never be disappointed, or at least you'll minimize your disappointment because you're just doing it because you love doing it. Um, I've worked with people that are working every night till 3 a.m. just because you know, they're not getting any overtime, but they just love, they want to make the best game possible. And um, those are the best people in my experience to work with, people that are just fully passionate about what they're doing. Um, Walk before you run. This is kind of a big one that we learned. Uh, I think Garnet and I were having drinks the other night, and he said something that was really good, which was think about the, your dream game to make that you've always wanted to make. Don't do that one first, <laughs> because, because you're going to just you're going to be making the most mistakes up front, and you're going to be learning the most. Um, so, like try try like what I did was I just took a game that already worked, and I just swapped out a model to see how that worked. Um, then that led to other things. So I often tell like students, um, just take Tetris or take you know a game like Tetris and just change the game rules up and uh, see if you can make something cool out of that. Um, and then you can try bigger things as you as you go. Um, build to the strength of your team. This one is a good one as well. Um, everyone has vastly different skill sets, and uh, we built our team making sure that we had the right overlaps. So that we had you know, somebody that was a designer and somebody that was a programmer, and then we had somebody that was a, a designer programmer. 
um, so that we could kind of like bridge gaps between roles and that we made sure that every role was kind of filled nicely. Um, and then we build games to the special skills that our team has, um, you know, considering the art style of our artists and what they're very good at working with. Um, so that helps things go so much smoother when you're building games that you know that your team will naturally do well at. Um, and this is a tough one, and this is something that I, can, I can't like, tell you how to do it, and I don't even know how to do it myself because it's so different between uh, people and groups. But everyone at some point is going to have to decide what you're willing to compromise on. Um, there were certain things that we were willing to compromise on and certain things that we weren't. And ultimately, like with Pebble, we decided that we weren't uh, going to compromise on certain things um, to change the game. And I, I have no regrets about that. Um, we're still planning on working on it um, when we have time. <laughs> Um, but everybody has to make compromises. Um, the question is just what are, you, what are you willing to compromise on? And there's lots of things as well that like, I think that I'm right on and other people think that they're right on. And ultimately, it's going to have to come down to some kind of compromise on, on somebody's part. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, that's always been something that you know, nobody wants to do, but it, it's, it's something that we kind of have to do. And then finally and most importantly, don't be afraid to fail. Um, go forth boldly and just, you know, if somebody's like, oh, don't do that, you won't be good at it, like, that should be even more motivation to do it because you'll learn how to do it better. Um, I started out working on games not knowing a single thing about anything and ended up just crashing and stumbling my way through, um, you know, all the development stuff and learning as I went. And so don't be afraid to fail. Go forth and fail boldly. Just learn from your mistakes and don't make them, <laughs> try not to make them again. Um, and that's where you'll grow the most is when you're challenged. Um, this quote is one of my favorite quotes um, from Michael Jordan, who says, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. So go forth boldly and, and make crazy awesome stuff, and I honestly can't wait to see what you guys are coming up with. I've, I've already seen some of your stuff. And it's awesome. It's super exciting. And it, and it gives us inspiration to make the things that we make as well. Um, so yeah, so special thanks to uh, Emily Green and, and Garnet Lee for throwing this whole thing and Amazon. And thanks for you guys, you know, to you guys for making this community such an awesome and vibrant and inspiring community to be a part of. So thank you guys.